Uh, good morning. Uh, Today is uh, August uh, 13th, uh, 2015. Uh, <clears throat> we're here <coughs> as part of an ongoing project in the Department of Bioengineering to uh, try to recapture some of the history and some of the uh, 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 early uh, activities in the department uh, through the <coughs> interviewing with uh, faculty and uh, uh, other associates of our department. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, interviewing uh, uh, Dr. Joel Michael. He's an emeritus professor at uh, what is now uh, Rush University uh, in the uh, Department of Molecular Biophysics and Physiology. Uh, he came here in uh, 1965, I believe, from... No, uh, 1968. 1968. Yes. 1968. Uh, uh, <clears throat> from MIT, and he was... Uh, a graduate student of our founding uh, head, uh, uh, Dr. Larry Stark. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do today is, is talk to uh, Joel about his uh, experiences, his perspective, and uh, his interactions with uh, students and faculty at what is now UIC and what uh, is now Rush University, but back then it was the University of Illinois Chicago Circle, and it was, uh, I think it was St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital. Presbyterian St. Luke's. Presbyterian St. Luke's yes. Hospital. And uh, so uh, with that uh, introduction, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Joel to tell us a little bit about what brought him uh, to Chicago and to uh, what... Uh, uh, his experiences were uh, on, upon arriving. Well, I was Larry Stark's last graduate student at MIT. I had done my first two years as a graduate student at McGill, uh, working in eye, eye movements and frequency responses of eye movements, and um, was in fact prepared to stay and get my PhD there um, for a project that I had just started to write up. Mm -hmm. When my advisor came back from a meeting at MIT and said, guess what? A graduate student of Larry Starks has just submitted your thesis. Oh, no. <laughs> and I said something a little stronger than, oh, no. Okay. Um, and uh, one result of that was I uh, decided I would finish up at MIT. So I went down to Cambridge to work with Larry. Uh, and I was still interested in eye movements and particularly the interaction of eye movements and the visual system. Uh, and so my work involved both some animal studies uh, and uh, doing evoked responses from, from humans. Uh, I defended in August of 65. Larry came back from Chicago. He'd, he'd already left, mm -hmm. had already established mm -hmm. this program. Uh, he came back, I defended, <clears throat> and went off to do two years of postdocing. Uh, one year in England, one year at Mass General in, um, oh, okay. in yeah, Boston. Okay. Uh, continuing this interest in eye movements and vision, and um, certainly playing a peripheral role as a neurophysiologist slash bioengineer. Um, and I never really viewed myself as a, a real card-carrying bioengineer, although I did belong to the society for mm -hmm. many years. Um, I got a phone call from Larry saying he had a faculty position available. Was I interested in coming to Chicago? This was 67, This was 68. 67, 68. Okay, okay. Uh, and what I understood was there was this biomedical engineering training program. It had three pieces. Right. One was the Circle, which was at that point a very, very new campus. Mm -hmm. uh, the other was Presbyterian St. Luke's and a Department of Biomedical Engineering that Larry was the chair of. <clears throat> and the other was the, the uh, University of Illinois Medical Campus. Right. Uh, and so there were three pieces, and I sort of fit into two very naturally. Um, and so I came, and I um, was given an office uh, that was not quite f constructed yet. They, this was in, at, Rush, at Presbyterian St. Luke's and what's now the Jelke building. Right, right. right. Uh, the walls uh, came up about that high. The rest was chicken wire. Oh my gosh. There was no ceiling. 
And I shared this office with Kian Agarwal, right, right. who was a uh, faculty member uh, at UIC, but was working in a lab, at least part-time, uh, at PSL. Right. Did you also have an office on the Circle campus? I never did. Interesting. Um, and it was only after you contacted me and I looked back at my files that I realized I actually had an appointment at UIC. Right. Um, there was no salary involved as far as I know. But, you know, as a faculty member, I didn't care where my salary came from as long as the check was good every, every I, I was week. fascinated when I learned that your appointment was as an attending uh, biomedical engineer. Well, that was a function of it being a hospital. Right. I mean, to, I, I think that indicates a, a status within the medical hierarchy of an attending physician. Well, yes and no. no uh, it's it's yes. higher than, I, than well, I'm treated when I go to the hospital <laughs> as, a, as a visiting bioengineer. Um, and, and so um, my first year, I don't know where Larry got my salary from. I assume it was from the training grant. We've um, heard this story before, I think. But, <laughs> we, well, again, <laughs> as faculty members, you really don't care. I mean, you exactly. sign a contract. Yeah, right. It says various things. Yeah. You don't pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, then I was given a half-time appointment at physiology uh, on the West Campus and a half-time appointment at PSL. Interesting. So there was a, a, that close of a link. There was that close of link. And, and, in fact, many of the physicians at PSL were attending physicians at the medical center. So there, there was a very, very close link at that point. And I actually had two offices and two labs and uh, discovered that the only problem with half-time positions is that everyone expects you to work full-time. Right. And so I was caught in that dilemma. Uh, in 1968, um, Larry Stark left. Yeah, I think he went to Berkeley. He went to Berkeley, the School of Optometry. He was certainly continuing to pursue his interest in, in pupils and, and eye movements and, and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, the School of Optometry at that time was one of the premier uh, research institutes in, in, in this particular area, this kind mm -hmm. of area. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there was an acting chair, may have been Jim Dixon, yeah, I'm not, know him. I'm not completely yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and um, eventually, within a year or so, Rush decided that uh, it was not going to continue the department. And what it did was to create a department of physiology. Now, one of the reasons for that is they had decided to reopen Rush Medical College. Oh. And there was a need for a, an entity that would satisfy the accreditors. And so there was a Department of Physiology. Okay, so for a time, if I understand this correctly, the U of I had a medical school and, and a research enterprise. Well, U of I has had a medical school for right. a very, very long but time. Then, and then Rush had the hospital and the research enterprise, but, but the medical education part had... Had ceased to operate in the Second World War. Uh, because all the, all the teachers were off in the Pacific or, wow. <laughs> or Europe. Um, but the story is that the Board of Trustees of the medical school met once a year to vote on meeting again next year. So the charter was kept in force. Okay. So it was very easy to restart, restart the medical school. Right. The original hope was we'd become a second medical school for the University of Illinois. The hmm. problem was you were trying to meld a private institution and a public, public institution, right. and they were very clever, but they couldn't, they couldn't make couldn't that work. So we continued as a biomedical engineering department for a year or so uh, with the same kind of interaction between UIC faculty and mm -hmm. people at Rush. Uh, Gianni Agrawal was working with, a, at the time, a graduate student, Jerry Gottlieb. Yep, I know that They name. were studying you know, motor control. Right. Uh, I believe Lawrence Ackerman, who had worked with Earl Goes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. was either still a graduate student about to finish up or had joined radiology and, and biomedical engineering mm -hmm. and was doing his computer analysis mm -hmm. you know, of mammograms. Right. Uh, I was continuing my uh, more neurophysiological uh, work on, uh, on eye movements and vision. Right. Um, and, and you, you did some work, I think, in, in multiple sclerosis, too, right? 
that was a sideline, but okay. I, I got approached by a neurologist who um, thought I could help him monitor things in certain ways. Right. Uh, and so I, you know, I said the, the eyes are sort of a, a well, way it, to view it, into the brain. It, it was it possibly we, we were looking at visual acuity. One of the problems that multiple sclerosis patients have is their optic nerves begin to fail, which means their vision begins mm -hmm. to fail. Uh, and it's relatively easy to to monitor that sort of thing. Uh, and so we it was a, it was a tool an, an easy tool for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, yes, I got in, I got involved with that. Uh, I also got my first lab computer. Uh, which was a PDV-8? A, a PD-8 lab, whatever, I, yeah, I forget yeah. the name of it, and um, had great fun. I mean, I had yeah. first programmed a digital computer in probably 1957 at Caltech. Oh, wow. I mean, That's right, you were an this, undergrad at Caltech. I was an undergrad at Caltech, yeah. and that was a really, really, really ancient computer. Um, but I started you know, writing programs for my research and said, you know, it would really be interesting if I could write something that would help my students learn some difficult things. So in fact, Jerry Gottlieb and I wrote a couple of programs and we had students do them in a laboratory setting. And to our surprise, naively maybe, but our surprise, mm -hmm. they didn't learn very much. And so I got very interested in what was it about a computer program that either helped or didn't help no, right. a student right. learn the kind of things well, I question was. people still ask and today. Still, <laughs> they still do, absolutely. But this led me deeper and deeper into um, an area which is now called the learning sciences. And UIC okay. has some very prominent people in this area right. now. Right. Um, and so I, I wound up writing um, some computer programs that do work, mm -hmm. and we know that because we ran the research on them. Right, right. Uh, got involved eventually with um, a computer scientist at IIT, and we built a computer tutor that utilized actual natural language. A student could type in a question, and not not right. not not yeah. not oral, but a student could type in a question and it would answer the question. The uh, the tutor could ask questions, and again, we were able to do research to establish that it actually helped students learn things that were important for my students. Yep. So again, you know, this is, this is a bit of computer science. And so I, I, I'm, I haven't totally moved away from bio something or other right, engineering. Right, I don't right. you know, however you want to call it. Yeah, the, uh, the trajectory, the career trajectories of, of bioengineers I, I find is, is, is not always a point to point. It's more of a random walk between uh, opportunities or barriers. Well, and, and I, I think this is, this is certainly true in, in the sciences and engineering. I think it's true in all of the interdisciplinary areas. Just by, by the nature of, of that interdisciplinarity and, and, and right. some things you open and some as things You go as far close. as you can go. And, 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 and then, then you find you another direction. <laughs> right. uh, and it, you know, it may only be 15 right. degrees off of where you were going, but it's a little different. And so people, People wander right. a bit. It's not quite a random walk or a drunken walk. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you <laughs> came, uh, bioengineering sounds like it was, it was blossoming uh, on this campus at uh, St. Luke's and at, at UI, uh, U of I Hospital. And then uh, there was a period maybe of retrenchment where the bioengineering program morphed into physiology. At well, at, at, the, at the point when they I guess uh, abolished the Department yeah, yeah. of Biomedical Engineering at PSL. Right. Well, it was now Rush, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and created a Department of Physiology. You had As best I can tell, our involvement with the training program ceased. Right. That was a 10 year training grant, so it probably ran out somewhere. It probably around ran then. out sometime around then. Right. Um, I think there were a couple of graduate students in the pipeline who we saw through to the end. Right. Uh, and then. It, it was gone. We were a department of, of physiology. physiology. Uh, I, I, I was actually the acting chair for a couple of years till they brought in Bob Eisenberg. Mm -hmm. um, he still is, right? <laughs> uh, no, he no, is, he's emeritus now. He's, he's, he's still, emeritus now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but his orientation was very mathematical, hence the biophysics in the right, title of the department. Right. Um, and and so. 
one of the things that Larry had brought were a couple of computer people of his. Jerry Masick, I'm blocking on, Alan Sandberg. Okay. These were all former graduate students. And Arnie Troska, I think. Troska was around for a while, but he was, he he was a vision. He was a vision, vision and eye movement person, okay. as, not, my, not a, a, as I remember it. Um, but Earl Ghost was a uh, computer pattern recognition right. kind yeah, of person. He, he was in ECE, or when I came here, he was in electrical and computer. Yes, and, and another person uh, whose name I remember is Bill O'Neill, but he was he, an information right, uh, engineering or whatever, whatever, they, whatever yeah, they call it. I think it. the names changed to protect uh, the names were constantly like changing. Right, and O'Neill, um, but O'Neill's still here in bioengineering. Uh, yes, I, yeah, I, yes, I understand yep. that. Yep. Um, and uh, I think uh, Agarwal has, I think, is emeritus. He should be. Yes, he was yeah. possibly older than I was. Yeah. Um, and and so the computer work that Larry had sort of begun sort of ticked along as what we now call bioinformatics yep, yep. sort of began to pick up speed, but it never again had a real academic bent to it. Hmm. So, you know, they, Because it they, was called cybernetics, I think. Then. Well, and, uh, cybernetics isn't quite the same as, as bioinformatics. Cy cybernetics is really control system engineering. Um, okay, bioinformatics it, was the processing of biological information. Now, in a hospital, right, a lot of that bio like medical it, 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 right, it's right. medical right. information. And then, of course, the, you know, the, the, um, the bookkeepers got automated, mm -hmm. and that right, was on a computer. Right, right. And so every medical center and hospital in, in the universe now, essentially, has a, uh, you know, a, an uh, information technology or information services department. And, you know, Larry and his people were some of the, the early portrayers of that. The early adopters or, or well, actually I, the I, early I, innovators. They, they, they were more the than adopters. They, they were actually, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I know from reading about Larry's career, he, he was taking courses in, or sitting in on courses in electrical engineering at Yale. Yes. And, and, and reading Shannon's papers while right. a medical student. Right. This is unprecedented even for today. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Electronic medical record, which is now becoming very, very big, uh, probably had its start back at Dartmouth. This guy's name is Weed, Doctor. I don't remember his don't first name. Yeah, yeah. Who came up with a kind of checklist approach for interviewing patients and gathering histories and all of that. And as the computer came along, they standardized put it. it they, yeah. they put it on the computer. It you know, but they were really clunky computers, and so it wasn't terribly effective and it sort of died and, mm. and then of course now it's you know it's taking off right. like a rocket it's, right. it's, a, it's 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 a very big thing medically but also uh, it's a very profitable thing for lots right. of people these right. days so uh, rush has um, rush as an academic institution in, in some sense sort of started with biomedical engineering yeah, I, f I find that fascinating. I mean, you know. uh, the, the other basic science, they had two other basic science departments, the usual things you have in a hospital. One was immunology and microbiology. Okay. Because, of course, they do the, all the, the testing of the bugs. Lab, chemistry labs, and, clinical and, chemistry. And, yeah. and, and, and we had biochemistry that ran our clinical labs. And both were sort of academic, right, but right. Larry, you know, biomedical engineering had no medical role at the time. Right. They were there to to build the capabilities of doing that. Yeah, the, the discipline of what we call clinical engineering today is, is, is still somewhat separate from yes. biomedical engineering or from bioengineering. And uh, again, many hospitals have clinical engineering right. departments. They test and service and whatever, that myriad right. of, of electronic devices right. that are monitoring patients. Right. But, the, but it's, it's so fascinating to me that biomedical engineering was sort of present you know, when, when the medical school was formed at Rush as, as a part of the curriculum. It, I mean, today, for example, we have uh, our sister campus in Urbana mm -hmm. starting a new medical school yes, I'm aware that's of supposed that. to be engineering focused. And they're supposed to try to uh, better prepare physicians to use the computer electronics. I will and, be very and, curious and, and, to see and, and, and what and they DNA do. DNA technology yes. To, yes. to personalize medicine. Yes. This, this is wonderful, but it's not new. <laughs> it sounds to me like well, 50 it's, years it's ago it was being done It's not new, here. and um, having been at a medical school for 40-some years, mm -hmm. 
uh, it's going to be very hard to do what they want to do. I mean, even medical students right. only have 24 hours a day and only seven days a week and only nominally four years, of which the last year is spent being recruited for their residency. Okay. So right. it's going to be very hard. But I, you know, I wish them well. I think, I think it's a worthwhile thing to attend. You know, to attend. But I know in Europe, they often have uh, integrated undergraduate graduate programs, which we have with a GPPA system, where the students come in as a freshman and they're committed to medicine. Well, and, and then you go yes. out the door after six or eight years as a physician. You don't do the two blocks of four. Well, it, 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 there are a number of different patterns. The one you describe is quite common. I mean, they, they, you, you go into medical school after high school. Right. right. And you do basic undergraduate work, much of it science, but not all of it. And then you do your, th your three years of medical school. Um, the Brits used to, and I think still do, your initial medical degree is, uh, is a bachelor's of medicine. It's an MBB something. Wow. The MD requires you to do a period of research. So it's, it, mm -hmm. it is, in fact, the graduate medical degree. Sure. Uh, so it, 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 it's highly varied. Um, what Illinois is probably going to have to do is be very selective in their recruiting. I think that's part they're, of the plan they're, there. They're going to have to be recruiting uh, people with really, really good science and, more yeah. importantly, analytical backgrounds, yeah. well, which is not your typical right. medical applicant, even today. This uh, discussion we've been having of the history of the program and your contributions mm -hmm. to it and its development is, is, is fascinating, I think, in providing perspective. How do we uh, build on this perspective in a way that can help uh, maybe future students who are interested in bioengineering choosing a path of biomedical engineering, bioinformatics, biophysics. Uh, it's, I, I'm asked <clears throat> when I visit a high school or a community college uh, to advise students to uh, delineate the distinctive features of all those. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm not sure uh, how we can identify the distinction without being uh, having more information about the individuals. But what, you, you have a lot of experience with One teaching of, the committed. Right. Uh, how do we help this next generation decide what to be committed to? This is a very difficult problem because at the K through 12 level, and, and it's, it's changing rapidly, but biology, any of the biological sciences, is taught from a very qualitative perspective. It's not, it's not quantitative, it's not mathematical, um, and many students who find it interesting, for mm -hmm. a whole host of reasons we could talk about, um, find the notion of taking calculus or physics repugnant, to put it mildly. Well, the, the biology program, as I understand it, at UIC today is a calculus-free zone. It's changing. It's changing. <laughs> yeah. It's changing yeah. slowly, but it is. But it is changing. And as an engineer, w without calculus, you can't talk about differential equations or systems that involve rates of change or accumulated absolutely. volumes. And, and well, this, you, you this restricts you to algebra in talking about well, physiology. And, and, which and you can do a lot. Of, you, you, well, but you can do a lot of physiology with just algebra. Yeah, but, um, it, but it still hinders. No, the, uh, you're you're the, you're uh, absolutely right. But the ability but, to characterize this. You know, when I was when I was first at University of Illinois at the medical school, for that two year period, mm -hmm. um, you know, they threw me into a student lab. I'd never taught anything in my life, and uh, I found it quite a challenge. But corridor conversation with other members of the department went something like this: medical school students. Uh, are people who love biology and fear math. Hmm. Well, that, it, and, and there's still an element of that. that, 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 that that's, that's really, that's, that's clear from teaching. Uh, and so it, 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 it's a problem of, of awakening the interest in biology in a quantitative sense. Right. Um, in many... You would think genetics would do it. <laughs> I mean, depends you how you, it depends how you teach genetics. And, okay. and, and I think you really mean molecular biology, not okay. genetics. Okay. Okay. You know, yeah. Genetics yeah. is, not is just, Mendel. Not, not just peas and beans. That, that's and, right. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it, it may be easier to get people with a quantitative background fascinated by the 
problems posed by biological systems. Um, you know, I've seen it go both ways. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, you're asking, there's an even more fundamental question, how do we get students into the STEM pipeline? Right, right. Um, the answer is you need better teachers K through 12. And right, many of them didn't take as all the science courses. That they didn't take the science or courses, or they, they, you know, they, their knowledge of math is very limited. You know, they're, they're right. the proverbial chapter ahead of the students. Um, I, I, I think the real place to start is probably in the freshman year at college. And of course, typically we do things backwards. The most junior faculty with the least experience are the one who wind up teaching the introductory courses. How do they teach it? Well, they teach it from the textbook, which may be okay and may not be okay, mm -hmm. but an awful lot of people who come in as science majors of some kind literally get turned off. We lose, I think, somewhere between a third and <clears throat> a quarter and a third of, uh, our, of our freshmen. It doesn't surprise students, me. Students who are interested, committed, and qualified uh, by the end of their first or second year are in a different major. They're in a different and, major. And, and so we, we can't blame our stars. We have to blame ourselves when, when, I, when we can't retain the students or help them find a challenge that that they want to assume. Uh, some go to business, some go to biology, well, pre -med, part of the, some part of the, part of the problem home. is that they never get confronted with a challenge. Uh, they're going through a lecture course. Uh, maybe there's a lab with it, maybe not. Uh, the lab is usually um, kind of cookbookish. Um, there may be a discussion session, and there may be problems to be solved, but they're right. routine things. Right. And so, in fact, we never expose them to a real challenge that could stimulate, right. oh, this is a neat, this is a neat question. Um, again, this is changing. Okay? Right. There are lots of places where the introductory courses are built around problems to right. be solved. S some of them are team building. Uh, it, it's team building. It, it building can, projects. It, it can be. Yeah. It can be projects. Right. There are a whole variety of ways, of, and, and it, it's happening. Right. Um, I have a sense. It's only that I have no data. Uh, it's easier to do a small liberal arts colleges where your classes are thirty and not three hundred or four hundred or five hundred. Um, well, there are statistics that show that, uh, you know, the, the, the Lawrences and McAllisters and these small, prestigious four-year schools have a higher percentage of graduates going into Ph.D. programs than the Ohio States and the it's Illinois. It's possible that Haverford is way up at the top. Yeah. It doesn't want oh, us yeah. to. Yeah. Um, but, but I think part of it is it's sort of, I, I think, in, 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 consistent with what you're saying, that the opportunities in a smaller group and s more but direct to go, interaction. To, you know, to go back to, uh, to my own autobiography, if you yeah. will, I went to Caltech as a physics major. You should have had all the special well, you know, and I, advantages. I, 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 I had all the advantages. I probably wasn't as competitive with my peers as mm -hmm. I should have been. But we had to take a biology course in sophomore year. And I had a lab TA who was so incredibly enthusiastic about biology that it really turned me on. Wow. And since I was struggling in physics and thought I could really do something, I changed majors. It goes back to in a small group right. with a good right. teacher, with an enthusiastic teacher, you can turn people yeah. on. I, I also was a physics major and was turned on to physics by a high school teacher mm -hmm. who was committed and basically had turned his house into f multiple physics labs I see. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and had kids come over and do whatever you, he had x-ray machines oh, really? and spectrometers okay. set up because he, he was a retired naval officer and uh, he could get things from surplus. From surplus, And yeah. so he had yeah. all this stuff, radioactive materials, <laughs> things you couldn't <laughs> even have today. Much less have kids right, running around right, the house right, all right, weekend playing right. with them. And, but then when I went to college at Georgia Tech in physics, I hated the labs. I hated the, the course where it was no fun until I think it was a junior, senior year, I got into a, a lab course where I went in and they just gave you a box. And they said, this is the stuff you need to do the Michelson experiment. Go see if you can do it. That's it's interesting you say that because my only real graduate level physiology course was at McGill. And the lab 
portion consisted of, they handed you a piece of paper, and the other thing they handed you was the key to the storeroom. Oh, wow. And you had to do an experiment. And so you so learned. So there, there was a project or, or a question. It, it was a question. And you right. had, you had and to you had to decide. Now, it, you know, it, there may have lot. been a classical that's, experiment yeah. you yeah. could right. mimic, I mean, right. but you still had to learn how to do it. And you had to learn what the data meant, and right. you had to learn how to analyze yeah. But we were learning physiology by doing it, not right. hearing right. it. And that, that's a great filter, because those that are bent. That's a great filter. Will, will but, it's also, but it's also a great motivator. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, and over the years, I've had a little bit of contact with the Illinois Math and Science Academy in Aurora. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, highly, highly, highly selective. Right. But they turn those kids loose on everything under the sun, and they are incredible. Right, because you, you can do it. Right, it's 168 hours in the week, and, if, and if the they fill are, and they uh, fill an awful lot of it. Okay, but they're they're right. really doing good things, yeah. going on to doing good things. Yeah. But um, and the corollary is, if they're not doing those good things, then you probably don't want them doing. You don't want them. You want them but, busy, and you want them. But engaged. the problem, of course, is yeah. you know that kind of education is expensive, and as a, right. as a society, we've not chosen to right. um, you know to spend the resources. Right, so there's problems getting students uh, into the pipeline, into the pipeline, and then helping them navigate the different channels through a curriculum, and then when you reach a stage where you are uh, motivated and excited, making sure that that you're you're taught, I guess, in the most effective way. This is well, it, what it, a lot of your work has been in. That's what a lot of my work has been in. But 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 there's another aspect to this. Um, by the time you're talking about juniors and seniors, and certainly graduate students, right. um, in your role as a, I don't mean you personally, but in, in our role as mentors, right. there's a, a very human inclination on the part of mentors to clone themselves. Right. Now, what that means in part is, if you get into a graduate program, the expectation of your advisor is you're going to go on to another academic. The only problem is there aren't these academic positions anymore. Right. We talked about this coming over. Yeah. Larry Stark had probably 20 graduate students. Each of those who went on to be a professor, many of them did, had 20 graduate students. And then if each of those students has 20, this is an exponential increase and that is not sustainable it's not in the long term. It's not sustainable. It's probably right now coming to a crunch. And, and, <laughs> and again, what, what one is beginning to see in... in graduate programs of all kinds, again, not just the sciences, mm -hmm. is, is a, a recognition that we have to prepare our graduate students for a wider array of I employment possibilities once right. they have their degree. Right. You know, some of you will make it in academia. Right. Some of you will become you know, tenured whatever, but most of you won't. Right. And you know, first of all, it's not a failure if you don't become another professor, and, and, and that's the problem. Yeah. You know, the, the, the mentor... Yeah. conveys the idea, if you don't wind up being like me, then you failed, right. and, and guess I've what, failed. I failed too. Right. Yeah, yeah uh, several of my recent students now, are, since the economy has improved, have been uh, taking jobs with um, GE, Abbott, you know, big corporations, big companies, and uh, I, I must admit, I, I'm on sort of, of two minds about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. For some students, I think it's probably a good thing. But some of the ones that are taking these jobs are my best students. And so I wonder, you know, are we going to lose uh, some of the next generation? Well, or? it depends what you mean by lose. I mean, right. I'm, I'm going to argue, no, we're not losing anything. Uh, I had a colleague. Just contribute at, in a different way? It, absolutely. I had a right. colleague, um, PhD in neuroscience. When we ran into a problem, it doesn't matter what it was. I don't even remember, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, wound up working for a law firm. He was their in-house expert in physiology and neuroscience. Yep. And he was using every bit of what he had learned, uh, and the internet was there, and, he, and, and so he, he was contributing in a very important way, and he, he found it rewarding. I mean, he, he found this to be an intellectual challenge right. uh, comparable right. to the ones he had had in the right. lab. Yeah. Uh, I, I think in, in my generation, and I guess your generation, Many of us, I mean, bioengineering really didn't exist when we were in high school or even mm -hmm. college. It's typically uh, as you, in taking a, a laboratory course, found some inspiration. You know, I was 
physics, doing things with microwaves, and mm -hmm. I found myself on a roof one day being irradiated. <laughs> and and, and I, I went back to the, to the mobile van that had the radar on top, and I, no I noticed that when the other student, who was now his turn to manipulate things right. on, on, on the radar range, was moving about, I could see him moving about. And then I, I noticed, gosh, well, if I can see him, I'm seeing reflections. That means the energy is like exactly. in a microwave oven, is bouncing off him and coming back. And I said, but it doesn't all bounce That's off now, does it? Where does it go when <laughs> it goes in his head or his heart or uh -huh. his liver? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that got me thinking okay. more and more about really complex problems. Yes. But, it, mm -hmm. but it, just, it just fascinated me thinking about sort of the, the, the radiobiological consequences mm -hmm. of, of microwaves, and even more than just microwaves, but maybe modulated microwaves signals that were modulated, say, with an ECG or an EEG signal. Could this convey information? Maybe mm -hmm. we could be mm -hmm. electronically made to feel better. And, and I had these thoughts, again, 40 years ago. But, and I realized not having had physiology, mm -hmm. not having, mm -hmm. I didn't understand enough to, on that side of the equation, but I could see where the, uh, the, uh, the technology could possibly be useful. But again, what, what you're talking about is you generated a problem. Right. And it interested you. And that's what I follow. And, and, you, and you follow it. And yeah. we, we've just got to find ways to give more students the opportunity to confront a problem and maybe get turned on by it. Right. And then they <clears throat> become their own self promoters. And then, absolutely. And, sure. sure. And <clears throat> this, is, this is the way it should go. That's the way it should go. Well, thinking of the future, wh wh where do you think things are going to go? Is, 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 are, is there always going to be a role for a bioengineer, or is a bioengineer going to morph into some other kind of There will always discipline. be a role for people who can mobilize expertise in multiple disciplines. I, 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 I chose the right, words very right. carefully. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Mobilize multiple disciplines. <laughs> okay. Mobilize expertise. Because the problem with labels is that's all they are. Right. Okay, is that, and so am I talking about bioengineering? Well, maybe. That, that's fine. You know, if there's an academic department of bioengineering, a person with that kind of interest might very well show up there. Okay? Right. But they might show up somewhere else. Um, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. What matters is we now have the technology and the science uh, to interact in, in completely new ways with living organisms. Right. Whether it's to study them, to learn right. how the organism right. works, whether it's literally at the molecular level or at, if you will, the ecological level. Mm -hmm. um, we have the technology to um, discover altered function. Mm -hmm. We have increasingly technologies to maybe restore those functions to normal. Yeah. Regenerate and regrow. Right. And, yeah. There's no limit to, to, to right. the pond. But right. it, it all arises out of, you know, the, the, the sea is going up. We know more right. and more and more. Right. We have right. more and more techniques. Uh, and so I think there's a great future for all of this. Uh, I just don't know what they're going to call it. You know, <laughs> you, you, you commented on molecular biophysics and physiology. Right. Now, Bob Eisenberg wanted that name change. To? It's not clear. I mean, in, in a sense, it more closely reflects what goes on in the department. Does that really matter? It's not clear to me that it does. Right. Um, department names no. change. You know, it used to be anatomy. Now it's anatomy and cell biology. Yeah. Why? Well, because anatomy is literally a dead science. Yeah. Well, I was when I was head of the Department of Bioengineering here. People asked me, "Is you know, what what, what is it that?" you know, what is it that, that defines bioengineering? I said, well, it's simple. It's what my faculty does. Okay. <laughs> so whatever they choose to do, I, I trust them. They're, they're clever, they're passionate, and they're working across disciplines. And, and to the extent that effect, it affects living things, I'll call it bioengineering. It, if it finds a role perhaps in a product or a clinical test, maybe it could be deemed biomedical engineering if it involves some computational or genetic or DNA assay, maybe it's a bioinformatics. But uh, it's just, a, in a Venn diagram sense, the intersection, the of, intersection. Those, of those two disciplines. And, and I think you could make that argument for, for biochemistry, for chemical physics. I mean, any of the traditional disciplines where they overlap, 
uh, gives one an opportunity for innovation and for engineering. Because the engineer typically is driven by the desire to optimize, to regulate, control, uh, get something to work a little better. Without, you don't actually have to understand everything about it. Uh, biophysicists will study it forever. You know, I, I, I commented that I have spent quite a number of years working with people in, uh, in computer science at IIT. Right. And, and my comment is not in any way to disrespect IIT. Um, the computer science I saw there was not science. It was engineering. My view of engineering right. is they build things. Right. They build them better, stronger, faster, right. you know, whatever. Okay. They don't do experiments. Science is about doing experiments. You form a hypothesis. Right. Uh, you develop an experiment that can disconfirm it, your right. hypothesis. Right. You perform the experiment. You look at the data. And then you come up with another hypothesis. Right. Okay. You learn another way not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's not what engineers right. typically do. And again, right. they're just two different it's a, they're, they're, they're really different disciplines. They, there's they, they there's really probably are. roles for both. There's clearly roles for both. It comes back to this question of labels. Okay. Is it bioengineering? Is it biomedical engineering? Right. Is it right. bioinformatics? Right. And the, to the extent that we try to overlap this with medicine, where we have all of this foundation of, of biology, physiology, mm -hmm. biochemistry, on you know being supplemented by all these emerging technologies, but falling on top of what's really a, a, a a, uh, a skill or a craft of, of being a diagnostician, being a physician, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, trying mm -hmm. to understand a disease that really, for the foreseeable future, is not fully understood. Correct. And mm -hmm. so you, and, and, and you don't have the option of just saying, well, I'll study that next year. You have to study it that next minute. You've got to do something. Has that, to that, be, that, that's correct. You know, sure. has to be uh, helped in whatever manner but, is possible. But again, but the only place these labels matter in some sense is that they do affect how we decide to train people to do certain things. And where the money goes and comes and, well, from. And, and then that means where, where the money goes, because right. you, have, you have to spend some money to teach someone. Right. Um, and I, I, I'm talking about biology and quantitation. Uh, I have a colleague at the University of Maryland in physics, who is a physics educator, educational researcher. Mm -hmm. They're developing new biology courses for pre-med students that <clears throat> incorporate math and physics, mm -hmm. but very carefully selected math and physics. physics. Okay. Physicians in general don't need to understand F equals MA. They really don't. Right, right, they right. do need to understand diffusion. Okay. Uh, there's some aspects of thermal physics they need to understand. Right, right, right. I mean, there, yep. there, 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 there's a lot yep. of it, but it's not a classical undergraduate physics curriculum that they yep. need. Yep. Physicians don't do a lot with calculus, but there's a lot of mathematics yep. that yep. is very relevant. Yep. So you've got to pick and choose how you so that you equip people to do the okay. kinds of things they're going to need to do. Right. You know, when they've gone further Well, on. at the K through 12 level, they're <clears> trying, in some cases, to invert the progression of biology, chemistry, Correct. physics, uh, following sort of what you're saying. Absolutely. Starting by, by flipping it and starting with physics. Correct. Um, Which now, makes as, enormous as, as sense. As a pure physicist, you might say, well, that's, that's naive or it's um, throwing the baby out <laughs> with the bathwater. No. But on the other hand, it, <clears throat> if you can instill... Uh, a respect and a, uh, an understanding of some physical principles, then those can be applied in chemistry and biology later on. And then well, it's more, they it's, may be supplemented by... It's, it's more than just physical principles. Physics is probably the easiest entree into science as an experimental discipline. Okay. Well, I think Newton would agree with that. <laughs> you have a pendulum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you want to determine the relationship between whatever. Right. Well, there are only a finite number of parameters, right. and you can identify them, and you can control them, and you can do a set yeah. of experiments and determine, oh, it's the length of the. Right, you can do a dimensional analysis and get the frequency and dependence on the length of the math. You right. can, right. but as, as, as yeah. a freshman in, in high right. school, you probably. But the right. point is, when you get to biology, you suddenly discover there are a gazillion right. variables. Right. Right. We don't even know what all of them are. Right. We can't control most of them. 
And the ones we can't control are only within limited range. And so it's easier to learn what science is, what a hypothesis is. Right, the process. The, the process. It's, right. it's much harder with biology, which is why it's taken biology so much so longer long. right. to develop into the kind of science it is now. And then, and only with that understanding will one be able to apply it in absolutely. medical and a ab absolutely yeah, and therapeutic. Sure. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking with you. I've and, certainly enjoyed and it. Learning uh, more about uh, the history of uh, bioengineering mm -hmm. at UIC and at Rush, uh, and of your contributions to it. And, and as way of thanking you, I. I don't have the monetary <laughs> resources that we might expect would be available, but, but we have a nice coffee mug okay. that hopefully will uh, remind you at least once yes. a day about uh, yes. UIC and bioengineering and a t-shirt that you can uh, wear on occasion. The t-shirt to, to, uh, is, is really invaluable. <laughs> I wear them to the gym every day. Okay, that's good. And I have a collection from all the places I've been. Yeah. So and and uh, I, uh, I, I thank you and uh, I, I think the old story about you have to, if, if, if you don't know the history of a place or a process, you're, you're doomed to making more mistakes exactly. than you perhaps can. you would do otherwise. Yes. And the more I learn about our history, the, the more I'm impressed by the, uh, the, the courage, the incentive, and the, uh, and, and the success of uh, the, uh, the early founding fathers. So thank you very much. Exactly. Thank, thank you, you very much.